The people you are about to meet believe that they've captured real ghosts on tape. Some of these images are strange, some are disturbing, others are shocking, but none can be authenticated. Are they real? You decide. Do you believe in ghosts? Tonight, witness the most shocking footage of what many claim are the world's scariest ghosts caught on tape. I went in the house and the kitchen cupboards were opening and closing on their own and the dishes were flying out of the cupboard. I mean, literally, it's if somebody had taken a Frisbee and were flinging them from the cupboard. I'd be sitting there watching television and the channels would just start flipping faster and faster. I turned to my husband and I said, Honey, I know you're going to think I'm completely crazy, but I feel there's an evil spirit here in the house. This bungalow in the sleepy harbor town of San Pedro, California, is the site of one of the most bizarre poltergeist encounters ever recorded. A woman who will call Jackie and her two infant children have been living with what she believes is an evil presence. Then one day her fears become reality. As cameraman Barry Conrad shoots this video, a strange red liquid of unknown origin begins oozing from the house. It was coming out of everywhere. It was just dripping out of the walls. Everyone just left except us. Things are starting to drip out of the cabinets. Nobody believes us, but it's happening. There it is. There it is, right there. Unbelievable. It's dripping. A few days later, life in Jackie's home becomes even more chaotic. Things just started happening around the house. Objects were being thrown, the kids' toys thrown around, um, you hear noises. Finally, Jackie can take no more. She leaves Barry Conrad this frantic message. I'm not staying here, Barry. I'm out of here. I gotta get out of here. I can't stay here. Barry and his team rush to the scene. Jeff Wheatcraft and a photographer, Gary Bohm, spend several months investigating the mysterious sounds coming from the attic. It's a decision they will soon live to regret. I feel a little queasy about going up there, but then I'm like, yeah, I guess I'll go up. If I got a partner, why? It's so bad. I try and tell them, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't want us here, it doesn't want you here, it doesn't want me here. You know, let's just, like, get out of here. Suddenly, they hear a strange noise coming from above. There were three snapping sounds, and they were clear as bell. And they were my left ear, and they went like this. The men claim at that moment they were attacked. What's wrong? What happened? I told you, get down! Get down! This isn't a good idea. This isn't a good idea. Yeah, please get down. I gotta get out of here. Well, it's definitely raising up. Jeff, please come here. Get this for me. Get the mic. Get the mic. Jeff, here you go, lady. Here you go. Here you go. What the hell happened? Are you okay, buddy? Look at his neck. Jeff, what's behind your neck? I don't know. What's on my neck? Come on, come on. 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 Come on, and then we saw like a something like a cord that was around his neck. It ended up over my head like this, and then it was twisted like this. I don't know how far to what degree, but I know it was twisted because it was tied around my neck. And then it was hung up over the nail on one of the cross members that go across the attic. The flash of Gary's camera lights up the attic and captures what appears to be an assault. Get a picture of his neck. Look at this. Look at his neck, oh my God. There were rope worms in his neck. He was in shock. He didn't know what had happened to him. He remembers suddenly like blacking out for an instant. Yeah, Jeff, what happened? Put something around my neck. When I look back on the whole incident, I knew that it's possible I could have been close to death. There's no question about that. According to eyewitnesses, Jackie makes one more startling discovery just before dawn. A mysterious red imprint appears on the forehead of a four-month-old daughter. Come on, you guys, let's go, please, let's go. Please, let's go, please, what happened to her? Oh, my God. I left that night. I never lived there again. 
I took my kids and left. In the history of organized psychical research or paranormal research, which began in England in 1882, there have only been a handful of reported cases where the phenomena was directly and distinctly attacking people in the environment or the investigators. And then there is this San Pedro case. Today, the house is quiet, so it's impossible to know what really happened here. Jackie and the kids got out, but her frightening memories will never end. Three thousand miles away in Ohio, another family believes they're not alone. The family had been hearing noises at night. They would wake up in the morning and find things moved, overturned, broken dishes and glasses. Searching for the cause, the father leaves a video camera rolling overnight. This is his amazing videotape. Watch as the glass moves across the table, apparently on its own. And then we see a typewriter move, which is not plugged in. Next, a chair slides away from the table, and the reclining chair mysteriously begins to rock back and forth. Then we hear the front door of the house left of the rocking chair open and then close. John Osborne offers his opinion of these disturbing images. I've watched it countless times looking for any evidence of foul play and I couldn't find it. Across the country, a man renovating his house videotaped something that appears to be even more disturbing. Contractors were complaining that they would come in in the morning and their tools would be moved and there would be damage. So he decided to set up a hidden camera to catch vandals. But what the camera records is not the work of a vandal. Well, the chair in this shot is pretty shocking, sliding across the floor. But the most shocking part of this particular piece of footage is the piece of sheetrock that's actually being ripped from the wall and pulled up and away. If it were just falling, it would have fallen just straight down under the force of gravity. This, on the other hand, was pulled up and away. It's very astounding stuff. Although unsettling, these poltergeists appear to mean no harm. But other cases are far more sinister. Meet professional demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren. A poltergeist can be terrifying. So anybody says that a poltergeist is mischievous, they better take a second look. During their 50 years of hunting ghosts, Ed and Lorraine claim to have encountered hundreds of poltergeists. They've also been the subject of numerous books and have consulted on several high-profile cases, including the Amityville Horror. Poltergeist is nothing more than a devil or a demon, as far as we're concerned. People say, this guy's going back into the medieval ages. There are no such things as devils or demons. Yes, there are. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. The Warrens feel that some of the most compelling evidence ever recorded has been videotaped by them in this Connecticut home. For months, the family, whose faces are obscured to protect their identity, have been tormented by what they fear is a poltergeist. Ed attempts to communicate with the troubled spirit. One knock for yes, two for no. Are you a man? Are you a boy? The mother leans against the kitchen table, her hands in full view as Ed continues asking questions. You want the people in this house to move? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Who is it that you don't like the most here? Is it? Is it? Is it their father? Is it their mother? Oh my God. Ooh. Okay. I command you to reveal your identity. Next, Ed decides to confront the poltergeist alone. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. 
what I did was use religious provocation. I have to provoke it into some type of outward manifestation. And that was my point in doing that. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to reveal your identity. On the following night, the family reports that the poltergeist seems to be more active than ever. Only now, its attention is focused on the family's 10-year-old daughter. The little girl is trying to do her homework, but you can see that the chair keeps sliding backwards. You're holding it down, aren't you? It's got that much strength to it. Now, if you watch, you can see the little girl's legs are up on the rungs of the chair. She's not pushing herself up from the floor. The mother is not tipping that chair backwards. No. Nobody is touching that table. The table moves of its own volition. The Warrens quickly arrange for three priests to perform an exorcism in the home, and the disturbance ends. But for how long? Could the angry poltergeist ever return? We have found that it can be quieted down, but then it'll escalate again. We still keep our fingers crossed because it could, and we hope and pray it don't. 3 a.m., I awoke from a dream, and I looked above my head, and I saw the torso of my brother uh, floating above my head. And this presence comes in the room, and I literally get paralyzed. My body gets paralyzed, and it's as if somebody's holding me down, and I can't move, and I can't speak. He had this, like, beautiful white aura all around him, and I remember him just looking at me and telepathically telling me not to be afraid, that he wasn't going to hurt me. So I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I couldn't do anything. So I closed my eyes, and I opened them again, and she's still standing there, and she's just staring at me like this. There was no face on the figure, and the face was slightly disjointed from the body. Everyone who was there that day insists the figure isn't human. When I shot it, there was no one there. I had people beside me looking the same way that I was looking. No one was there. Totally unexplained. I mean, besides the crew, there was nobody, you know, for kilometres around the place. There was just nobody anywhere. Plus, there was a suicide which occurred at the site where the video took place. Is this mysterious figure wearing the robe? Think they know the answer? No doubt in my mind whatsoever that that was a ghost. That, that definitely was a ghost. Back in the United States, another apparition is believed to have been caught on tape. For months, the family inside this Pennsylvania home claimed to hear strange footsteps in the middle of the night. In an attempt to determine the origin of these ghostly noises, the family sets up a video camera in the hallway. This is what it captures. Watch as the glowing shape floats down the corridor, then appears to enter a doorway. What is this phantom menace? Edgar Harris believes that it is the arm of his dead mother who once lived in the house. She had a tendency to get up and, and wander at night, so uh, uh, that's probably what she's doing now. She's wandering around. Why does it seem that his mother is haunting their home? Well, Edgar thinks she's become the guardian spirit of her great-grandson who now lives there. I think she comes and watches him when he's in his cradle at night and just watches over everybody in the house. Is this really a gentle spirit from beyond? For Edgar, the videotape speaks for itself. But this mystifying footage pales in comparison to what has been captured here in Greencastle, Indiana. This weird tale begins with these two men Guy Winters and Terry Lambert. For years, Guy and Terry have heard rumors about a haunted mansion on the outskirts of town. People would see a ghost of a female, an apparition that would 
drip down the lane that led to this old house. Intrigued, the men decide to investigate the deserted house with their own cameras. This is the actual videotape from that unforgettable night. The storm was going lightning crashing. Lightning like I've never seen. It was like dripping plastic out of the sky. Really strange. And when we climbed the trees there was this big two-story old brick mansion, abandoned, kind of dilapidated looking. Unaware of what awaits them, Guy and Terry go inside. The only thing's only shadow, so the house still was pretty eerie. And basically, we took a series of pictures all through the house, the upstairs, downstairs, stairwells. Terry claims that he then ventured back outside to take more photos. I took a series of three pictures of an upstairs window. And after I took that series of pictures, I went around to the back of the home and I took a picture of the doorway. Still in the house, Guy continues his investigation, but suddenly he feels that he is no longer alone. I felt this presence come over me, and the smell was like sulfur and roses. A real, a real strong smell. You hear that? Heartbeat. Bump, 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 bump. And this heartbeat was in my head, but it wasn't my own heartbeat. I really felt like I was dying. This feeling of anxiety was just overwhelming. And I was afraid I wasn't going to make it out of there. Guy and Terry run from the house, afraid to stop until they reach the safety of their van. But this ghost story is far from over. When Terry develops the film from his still camera, he's shocked by what he sees. Three consecutive pictures of what appears to be a woman glowing in a pink light, floating in the second story window. Another pink shape is captured at the back door. Pretty much it blew me away, I have to say. I've never seen anything like that on film. Could this be the ghost of Greencastle? or merely a photographic abnormality. To find out, Guy and Terry showed the pictures to their friend, photo expert Mick Orman. What is in the picture came from the negatives. It's very interesting and a little unnerving. Next, these mysterious images were analyzed by a computer graphics expert, Sean Dempsey. It's during Sean's high-tech examination that the photograph reveals another startling secret. And then I tried something called bass relief, which basically takes the, uh, the light and dark parts of the picture and emphasizes them. And I got the creepiest thing from this one photo. Her face, and I don't know how else to describe it, but that to me just looks like a skull. I've got to be honest, it's either a real photo of a ghost or it was done with a photographic technique that I don't know about. With experts at a loss for answers, Guy and Terry have their own theory. They now believe they've photographed a real ghost. But if it's true, then whose spirit is it? Guy believes that the pink lady is a woman who lived and died here in the early 20th century. Her name? Irene O'Hare, the same name that they found scratched onto one of the bedroom walls. Guy and Terry make more trips to the mansion, but the ghost of Greencastle does not reappear. However, the men capture two other images that are just as difficult to explain. The first is this photograph of what appears to be a woman in a flowing gown. Due to her intense color, she is known as the Gold Ghost. The second strange event occurs while Guy takes pictures of the mansion. Suddenly, three cloud-like shapes fly by. Is this merely fog or some type of mist? If so, it would need a strong breeze to travel this fast. But Guy's clothes and hair never move, indicating that no wind is blowing. Unfortunately, these and other questions may never be answered because the mansion was destroyed to make way for this cornfield. But the memories of the Greencastle mansion live on with Guy and Terry, who may have done the unthinkable.
captured images of visitors from the other side. What awakened me was a smell, a very distinctive smell. It was the body smell of my mother who had died nine years ago. It came and it passed through my body. And as it passed through my body, I felt this incredible sense of joy, release of all worry, tension. I could feel the air in my ear. I could feel like a vapor going into my ear. She was trying to say, trying to tell me something. And I screamed. I mean, I really, I screamed because I was so terrified. On the island of Hawaii lives a five-year-old girl who seems to have a ghostly guardian. Her name, Carissa. Since she was four months old, her family believes that she has been surrounded by a mysterious presence. She kept looking behind my left shoulder and she, was, she kept giggling. Then I just put her down on the floor. I laid her down on a quilt and took three photos of her. And when I had it developed, the pictures came back and there were these two ribbon looking like objects. And she was looking down at it. No one can see these ghostly images, except in photographs. I took two photos of her in her swing. And when we had the photos developed, they were back in the photos. Picture after picture, these unusual entities have been captured hovering near Carissa. Her family insists that whatever is behind this phenomenon is not of this world. Until somebody does can give me a really great argument that these aren't, they aren't what we think they are, then um, I'm going to believe that they are some sort of being that's allowing us to be, to photograph them. Of course, the only person who can shed any light on the subject is Carissa, but she's too afraid to talk. When I put her to bed at night, sometimes she'll say, they're scaring me. When I question her about it, uh, she, I can't get any real definite answer out of her. So for now, Carissa's family says that all they can do is accept these unusual visitors. What we're seeing in the photos, it's just saying, we're here, we're part of your world. You have to trust and believe in us too. And just because you can't see us with your eyes, doesn't mean that we don't exist. Carissa's story is strangely similar to the film, The Sixth Sense. You know the accident up there? Yeah. Someone got her. They did? A lady. She broke her neck. Oh my God, but you can see her? Yes. Where is she? Standing next to my window. In this frightening film, an eight-year-old boy named Cole can see ghosts. Maybe we shaking. But his mother can see nothing. Cole, what's wrong? That is, until she examines photographs of her son. It's then that she realizes in each photo, Cole is seen with a mysterious light, apparitions from another dimension. I want to tell you my secret now. Millions, this is pure entertainment. But for one six-year-old boy, this big screen ghost story is all too real. His name is Justin Quinn. Like Carissa and the boy in the sixth sense, his baby pictures revealed him to be surrounded by unexplained white lights. But as Justin grew older, these ghostly images took on a more human form. The first experience that I remember was him saying that he saw a man standing in the doorway of his room. He was standing there, and then he walked away, then he walked through the other way. Justin also claims to have been visited by a second apparition, 
that of a young girl. I didn't say anything. I was just scared and going under my covers and peeking under. And then she's still there. And she's coming closer and closer and closer and closer. James Van Prague, world-renowned medium and best-selling author of Talking to Heaven, visits the Quinn's Connecticut home in an attempt to make contact with the ghosts. Hello, how are you? How are you? Good. As nice cameras roll, way. Van Prague meets Justin for the very first time. Hi, Justin. How are you? Good. Good. When I first walked into this house, I felt definitely a denseness to it, a denseness of the energy in the house. Can you sit here? I'll sit up here. Next, Van Prague begins the delicate process of questioning the shy boy. Do you see them stand there? Yeah, I saw one little girl standing in my room. What did she look like? Was she blonde hair? She had scribbly hair. I've worked with many, many children, and children are very aware. They're very open. They're very sensitive to the spirit world because they're very close to the spirit world. Here's your room. Justin shows Van Prague where he first saw images of the man and the little girl. Oh, this is a nice room. Is this where you saw the little girl? This is when I was... You were here. And were you sleeping or were you awake? Awake. You were awake. Every yeah. single time I'm awake. Next, they move to the basement where Justin also claims to have seen the two apparitions. Are they in that room there? They're Where? in the closet hiding. What do you think she likes to play in here? The toys. The toys, exactly. She likes the toys. And sometimes she plays with the game. Why would these spirits be haunting this otherwise happy home? During Van Prague's investigation, he senses what could be the answer. I have a feeling that around this area, this location, was a place where there were gallows. And that might sound very, very strange, but a place where there were people that were killed. After an hour with the boy, Van Prague comes to a shocking conclusion. Justin has been seeing ghosts. Van Prague knows because he believes he's seen them too. Back in the kitchen, he explains his psychic vision to Justin's mother. I just tuned in to see what was going on. What I picked up was, I picked up two girls. I picked up also one the long blonde hair, similar to yours, the lighter. Okay. And um, I picked up there was a man holding their hands. And the man I picked up, it, it was very interesting because it felt like a father figure to me. And I saw a very long, long, drawn face. I'm starting to. His cheeks are much thinner. Yeah. Van Prague describes the spirits to a police sketch artist. Much longer thin. Much longer. Much thinner. Much thinner. And much rounder eyes and dark. Now, for the first time ever, the rest of the world can see the visions that have been haunting Justin. Look at her. That's that girl in your bedroom, huh? Is that her? Yeah. Does that look like her? Yeah. I think that, indeed, he does see spirits in the house. He's very attuned to that energy. And his mind has not been clouded yet by society. So he's very aware, very open, very innocent, if you will. So what does the future hold for Justin and his real-life sixth sense? Only the spirits know for sure. And for now, they're not telling. I looked up, and out in the hallway was a glowing light. It was pulsating, fading in and fading out, rather than just a solid glow. This ball just sort of started to raise up. It was about half the size of a basketball. It just grew slightly larger, a little bit smaller, moved off to the wall, and just disappeared. For as long as she can remember, Linda Davis claims that she's been able to see spirits from beyond the grave. There's just things that I've, I've seen that uh, I can't really explain why I see them. Inside this abandoned house, deep within the basement, Linda encounters luminous entities known as orbs. Spheres of glowing energy believed to be spirits returning to the physical world. There it went right up her arm. It went right up her arm, right to the ceiling. I can feel when there are orbs around. It's like I, I get a, a, a tingling up my spine. There's one went right past her fingertips. There comes another one down, and it's going left. 
going over to the top of the steps. Renowned parapsychologist Dr. Andrew Nichols has investigated more than 600 cases of the paranormal. Dr. Nichols carefully examines the home. I was able to take both a temperature measurement and uh, electromagnetic field measurement of, of a couple of the orbs and they are emitting a very high electromagnetic field and they're about 10 degrees hotter than the surrounding environment which indicates to me that they're essentially a, a ball of energy. Nichols believes that the magnetic field causes people with psychic abilities to be even more sensitive. Happily, the house is no longer abandoned and the new owners are interested in further exploring this vital link to the world beyond. Some of the most mysterious orbs ever witnessed are here in Colorado's Black Forest. My house is different from other houses because um, mine's kind of haunted. The man who captured them on videotape is this boy's father, Steve Lee. I've never been exposed to anything like this, paranormal or otherwise, so, you know, we really did not, we didn't have a clue as to what was going on. Steve's journey into the supernatural begins innocently enough. In 1992, he and his family moved into what they thought was their dream house. But soon after, their dream took a frightening turn. We uh, went on the hunting trip for like 10 days up in the mountains for the whole family. And when we got back, that's when things really started to happen. We immediately noticed that the furniture was not in the same spot. We was hearing voices, shadowy figures that you're not really sure if you're seeing or not. The boys were, were really terrified because of the fact they didn't know who it was, and I didn't know who it was. Determined to prove that these events were man-made, Steve installed high-tech security cameras around his property. But the images they captured were unlike anything he'd seen. Small orbs are videotaped floating through different parts of the house. I don't have a clue and still don't have a clue as to what it is. Then, outside, Steve tapes larger orbs that are even harder to explain. Notice how they fly around the trees and even change direction. Steve believes that these orbs are not created by torches or any known camera trick. But the most amazing discovery is yet to come. One night, while Steve and his family are sleeping, a camera is left running. This is what it records. The most incredible orb ever caught on tape. Its astonishing size, brightness and detail seem to defy scientific explanation. Dr. Michael Coots consults with the police on occult activities. He visits Steve's home and agrees with him. It holds some disturbing mysteries. When I'm out here at night, I feel almost as if I'm being watched, that there are other people or energy, if you will, around me. It's a sensation of awareness and of power of energy. After witnessing these eerie events, do Steve and his family ever think about leaving the Black Forest? We decided long ago that we would not let anything chase us from here or run us from our house, whether it be man-made or otherwise. So Steve continues to videotape the ghostly glows that surround his house, in the hope that one day he'll discover who or what might be visiting from the spirit world. I looked over at the mirror, there was this fog, kind of like smoke. It was, it was cold. And the mist was above me on the steps. It was definitely female. I don't know how I can say that because it was a mist and not a human form. I knew right then that I'd seen a ghost because there's no other way you could explain that. Alton, in Illinois, may look like a typical Midwestern city. But it harbors a frightening secret. It's the site of what could be the most haunted house in North America. 
Welcome to the McPike Mansion. Built in 1869, the now abandoned house is shrouded in legends of violence and fear. There was supposed to be a lady that was either drowned or murdered in the bathtub. There's been folklore that somebody hung themselves there. The woman that haunted it had been somebody that her husband had been killed in the, in the uh, Civil War. Regardless of what is fact or fiction, residents and paranormal experts believe the house is haunted. We think that there are at least 10 spirits here. And they think the spirits have gathered in the basement. No sunlight penetrates these rooms, so the best way to film paranormal activity here is with an infrared camera. Yeah, this, is actual... this, is, this is the wine cellar. This is where she gets most activity. Dr. Rene Horath and a group of fellow researchers descend into the basement with their video cameras rolling. What they experience, they'll never forget. We were kind of chatting and just walking around, and uh, suddenly we walked into a different room, and there was a very, very thick mist. It's, it, it almost looked like a thick smoke. Oh my God, I can see it moving right around in front of me. Is this just a freak of nature or the physical manifestation of a ghost? Oh my God, okay. I'm recording. I am on record. Oh boy, well you can really see it now. I could feel it even through my clothing. I could feel it felt like, like feathers were brushing against my body. Oh, big time, miss. Big time. Big time. Rene and the other witnesses dismiss the theory that the mist is humidity or some other substance of this world. If it were mist, we figured it would leave condensation on our lenses of our cameras. You would feel it on your skin, on your clothes, but there was nothing like that. It felt electric. Oh my gosh. Even harder to explain is the way the mist moves around the basement, as if it has a will of its own. Oh my gosh. I can see it changing directions. Now, now, as witnesses on this, this room was clear when we left it. Right. It was totally clear when we left it just a few minutes ago. Then, as quickly as it materialized, the mist vanishes. Still mist? A little bit. Not, not hardly at all, by comparison. What exactly did Rene and the others encounter down in the basement of the McPike Mansion? I think the mist is definitely a, a very huge entity. It has a lot of strength. Whatever it is, it's clear that the mystery of this haunted house is far from being solved. Tonight, we've witnessed shocking images that suggest a world beyond the one that we can see and touch. But it's a world that doesn't always welcome our prying eyes. Do spirits really walk among us? No one knows for sure. But who can ignore the videotaped evidence of what many claim are the world's scariest ghosts caught on tape?